Hi, good evening, everybody. This is uh, Chris Bloom. I'm the president of the board of directors for the Mid-City Neighborhood Organization. Um, sent out a couple of notices asking for interested parties to present to our regular membership. And this is what we do on the second Monday of every month. So happy 2021, everyone. Um, thanks for showing up and spending some time with us and staying involved and engaged with uh, Mid-City New Orleans. Um, I just entered the agenda for this evening in the chat, um, and I'll go through a couple items um, for tonight, as long as as well as some other documented announcements that we have. Um, we're going to try and conduct most of questions through the chat, um, but if you don't have that chat capability, please just uh, give us a little bit of warning, and then um, after our main presenters, if anybody else wants a few minutes to present, please let me know. So, all right. Um, so tonight, uh, I basically just wanted to announce one form of business for Mid-City Neighborhood Organization. Um, we currently have a board vacancy that we're seeking to fill. Um, our bylaws say that we can hold a maximum of 11 members, minimum of seven, I believe. And right now we're sitting at 10 and we kind of need a tiebreaker <laughs> position and odd number is probably ideal. So if you could, please uh, let me know of your interest. Uh, the board can appoint you to serve. Uh, it is a volunteer capacity. Uh, we have not chosen our executive membership yet. That'll happen at our next board meeting. So um, basically you would be helping us organize meetings like this, uh, outreach within the community and different events that we'll be holding throughout the year. So yet to be planned and, and yet to be thought out, but we'd love your input and anyone's uh, information on this. Uh, the only requirements would that you be uh, a member of MCNO, which is easily done uh, through our website, and also um, a resident of Mid-City. So uh, on to our agenda. Uh, I have uh, Mr. Mike Castellano from Dirty Dog Companies who wanted to reach out to some business owners and uh, residents of the neighborhood interested in some of his waste stations. Do you want to take it over, Mr. Castellano? Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Mindy for uh, reaching out and trying to get some information on our program. The program's called the uh, Community Service Program. It's the uh, best way to describe it is uh, the same as the Adopt a Highway. We place uh, free dog stations in unlimited bags for all the community to use. We place them in your neighborhood. There's no expense to the neighborhood. We have environmental minded businesses that, uh, that provide all the expenses. And for that, uh, we let them put their logo on the station for community recognition. So all expenses are free. Doesn't cost anything. Doesn't cost the city. We pick up the trash once a week. We supply all the bags and uh, only thing we need to do is we can't put it on public property. We can only place them in uh, community businesses around around the uh, neighborhood. So uh, I think it's a win-win situation. The city has no expense. The uh, community has no expense. And uh, some of the local businesses get their names out there. So it's a pretty good program. And, uh, if anybody's got any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Yeah, you said you had some existing locations. Can you mind sharing some of those with us? Yes, we uh, we have presently, uh, we have all of the English Turn. We have St. Rock, and uh, that's the two two biggest communities we got now. And we have them, we have them all over town. We have them at CC's on Espinade. We got them at Whole Foods. We got them uptown. We got them all, all the way to Lafayette. We got them in the Lafayette Parks and Recreation. So it's it, it's a pretty good program. Uh, we just started a year ago, and uh, and uh, the, like I said, the only problems we have is that, that the stations have to go on businesses because the uh, New Orleans doesn't want us putting them on the uh, city property. So if anybody has a local business in your community, we'd be glad to come out, set up a free station for everybody to use. Yeah. Do, um. Other than Nord, have have we gotten any information from uh, Friends Lafitte Greenway? Possibly. I mean, I know they're another recreational area that's high use. I'm going to put your. Uh, I've already put your links to your website uh, and contact information in the chat as well. Okay. Yeah, 
I think ideally also like, um, you know, your stations do like, they don't collect the waste as well. No, we'll do that. We provide that service. We'll come out probably once a week and uh, keep them clean, spray them, you know, make them smell good. And, and uh, uh, like I said, it's uh, they go up uh, and uh, people, we got them all over uptown. Uh, like I said, anybody in the community can use 20, 30, 40 bags. It's all free. So it's never an expense to you guys. And uh, if maybe if you decide you want to just buy them outright and put them in place, I mean, we can do that too. But I think it's a lot easier and saves you a lot of money just to keep, you know, just keep it with the uh, sponsorship program. Understood. Yeah. Uh, I think it's probably a really great idea to help keep the area clean for sure. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any property of our own as an organization, but, you know, no, as members, we all have. Uh, we all might have a little bit of peace. So um, I'll definitely be sharing your information with any interested parties and, and want to help put you in contact, uh, you know, to help keep the, keep the neighborhood clean. Yeah. Yeah. If there's any, uh, if you'd like to do a trial basis, I'd be glad to come out and put up a couple stations, see how it work out. And uh, we'll take it from there. Fantastic. Um, you, you might, have, I read your phone number over here. It's uh so Dirty Dog Environmental, it's 504-247-4390. And also- Right, if anybody's got any questions or wants, wants any more information, just be glad to, just give me a call. Be glad to sit down and talk to you. Is there a cost of sponsorship for these stations? Yeah, it, it varies. Uh, we, we, right now, we're uh, State Farm. We, we work with local vets, State Farm. There's a lot of people out there that's uh, environmentally minded. So it, 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 it there's there's fees they pay, but it kind of pays for the equipment in the bags. It's, it gets kind of expensive with the uh, trash pickup and supplying bags. You know, a lot of times, two, three, four hundred bags a week. So when you got ten stations out there, we we need all the help we can get. Understood. All right. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Castellano. I uh, appreciate it. Y'all have a nice night. Thank you. All righty. Uh, also this evening, uh, David, uh, David Hecht uh, was interested in uh, presenting some information about a plan development. Great. Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. Uh, <laughs> good evening, everybody. Thanks very much for letting me uh, join the meeting. Um, <clears throat> Chris and I spoke a couple of weeks ago um, about the project and uh, following up on that, I wanted to reach out to the um, full group here um, and introduce myself and uh, tell you a little bit about what I'm starting to work on. It's it's very early days. Um, I'm a, my name is David Hecht. I'm a local New Orleanian. I'm an architect by trade and training and uh, work as a real estate developer as well here in town with my uh, firm, which is called Formwork Development. Um, I'm starting to think about and, and work on a, a housing project um, near the Lafitte Greenway and wanted to um, introduce all of you to the project and sort of open up a, a line of communication with uh, MCNO as the project starts entering the planning phase. Um, I've been working with um, some folks in city government and we've identified some city owned land uh, the former DPW signage signal shop as a um, potential opportunity for us to think about a, a new um, housing and mixed use development. Um, and the idea is that the, the project will primarily be housing. Um, it'll be a, a, an apartment building. It'll have some affordable housing in it and then also have some um, amenities and neighborhood facing uses that um, I'm interested to kind of start a dialogue with all of you about. Um, the uh, project, which, which really gotten me excited and interested about the project is the conversation that I'm having in partnership with the city about how we might um, use and, and create a building on this site that can um, have some positive spillover effects for the Greenway in particular and, and Mid-City more broadly. And we're, we're working on an idea where um, revenue from the building would go to support the Greenway's um, operations, programming, 
and ongoing maintenance. Um, so the idea is that the building will, will be built next to the Greenway and um, through its operation, some of the revenue it generates will support the Greenway. Um, there's also an affordable housing component to the project, both um, some affordable units within the building and then the possibility for um, uh, some of the proceeds from the project to uh, help support an affordable housing fund is another kind of conversation we're having with the city. Um, in terms of, of use, um, we've talked about things in the building like a, a, a daycare or early childhood education center, the idea being that that could um, help some of the mem folks who live in the building, but also be an amenity to the community. And I think one of the things I'm interested to hear tonight is um, if there's interest in other types of uses that um, you all think you need in the neighborhood and in the community. Um, I, uh, I, li I live in um, the Irish Channel, uh, so I'm not from Mid-City. I don't live in Mid-City, but it is a neighborhood I've spent a fair amount of time and I'm starting to get to know uh, better and better. So I think I'd just love to take your questions and, and know that I'll, I'll be uh, in contact with you as, as the project proceeds. All right, feel free to enter questions in the chat or uh, or jump in at, at now. Do you have a the exact uh, cross streets location? Yeah, it's um it's right at the it's at the corner of Broad and Lafitte Avenue, um, so near the near the Broad Theater or the or the pump station there. Would it extend past Dupree, or would that kind of be the end of it? Um, that'll probably be the end of it. Um, you know, that's, that's what we're looking at right now is, uh, mm -hmm. is broad to Dupree. I'm just gonna... Did you say how many units? Oh, oh, great. Um, you know, it's, it's still in flux. Um, I think, you know, we're, we, we really, we really don't know yet. Um, I think, uh, it depends really on how much of the site we are able to use in our conversation with the city. Um, but, you know, I, I think, you know, we're, we are still trying to figure it out. Uh, are you working, this is Bob Rivard, are you working with the Broad Community Connections in any way with on the project? Um, I have not spoken to Broad Community Connections yet, um, but I certainly, can and will so that's a that's a really helpful um reminder yeah they're they're right adjacent their offices are right there at the whole foods and they're upstairs in the whole foods, right you know. right um, is this going to be uh tax uh, is there tax credits for the, for the development or um good good question you know probably not because it's going to be new construction so it, it won't won't qualify for any historic tax credits um, what we are looking to do is, um, because it's on um, city land, is to do a, um, a, a property tax pilot that would dedicate funding for the Greenway and possibly for affordable housing. Okay, thank you. Sure, yeah. Um, we don't know, I mean, if we don't know how many units, do we know a height or any sort of dimension? Yeah, sure. I mean, we're, we're, we're looking... Um, right now at four to five stories um, and the idea is that the building if the the tallest portion of the building will be closest to broad street and we're looking at potentially stepping the height down as um the site moves towards uh, north dupree so maybe from three stories at north dupree up to up to five at broad street but again it's it's all early days is there any current assessment that you might be aware of of the major infrastructure that exists here considering there's a major pumping station right here at broad and the uh st louis canal there as well um i guess uh, in, ter in terms of how our project might impact the existing infrastructure is that what you're asking chris correct and maybe some uh you know some uh, subterranean infrastructure that, that we just don't know exists sure. as this city um, property as well. Yeah, re really good question. Um, we haven't done any kind of uh, you know soil borings or uh, geotechnical investigations um, or anything like that. Um, you know, I think 
the historic uses here, obviously there was the railroad and then um, some, some warehouses, but I, I believe most of the stormwater infrastructure is concentrated in the canal, um, in, in the visible portion of the canal. Um, but that's certainly on our radar as we, um, as we proceed. And I know that there's been some, a fair amount of road work done in this area uh, and, and there should be decent information because some of that work is, is recent in terms of stormwater management and, and general storage and water board work. Yeah, this being a heavy industrial use site and city property, there's probably very little, if any, uh, service connections or for incoming water or for sewage. Um, you know, I know a lot of portable units were there for a while for uh, the public apartment works. Um, so obviously that would be required. Um, not looking too much into the zoning right now. Uh, obviously, do you happen to know what this area is zoned for? Sure, and, and that's that's a really good question and, and something that we're you know working on actively. Um, this area is um, is is zoned um, OSG, which is a Greenway Open Space District, and so we are um, talking with City Planning Department and you guys and other stakeholders about what it might mean to um, build a complementary use within the OSG zone. And the idea again being that the, um, there's a trade-off between allowing some building on the site and it's supporting uh, park operations and maintenance. So um, I think that's, a, that, that, that's the kind of interesting and, and, and critical kind of idea and issue that we're, we're working on. Um, and so the, the proposal is to say, hey, let's take city on land, which, um, is, is zoned OSG, but there's no capital available at the city level to make this part of the park anytime soon. We will um, build a building on a portion of it, and our building is probably going to cover about half of the site. And the other half of the site we would build as parks so will basically double the width of the greenway. And then the remainder that's given over to construction is a use that we hope will be complementary to the community and the greenway. And then generate this revenue stream for operations and maintenance. Yeah, as of now, we don't know of a, a total unit number, so we wouldn't know really a percentage of affordable housing presented with this plan or a yeah, rough idea. I mean, uh, we're, we're targeting 10% 10, 10 at 60% AMI. Um, and I think as you rightfully noted, as the scale of the project comes into focus, hopefully over the next, um, you know, couple of months, we'll, we'll refine that number. But um, that um, the, the current city planning targets for inclusionary zoning in non-core districts is 5%. So we're basically doubling that target. And that was how we started with the 10% number. Uh yeah, am I explain that figure? I forget what Sorry, that yeah, stands I saw, for. I, I saw that comment. I, I appreciate that. So, um, yeah, AMI stands for uh, uh, area median income, and it's a way of evaluating the income level of a family or an individual relative to a metropolitan area, and it's the metric that's used to um, uh, uh, sort of control who has access to affordable housing. So when I say that 10% um, of the apartments will be reserved for people making up to 60% of the area median income, uh, with the, in, in layman's terms, area median income in New Orleans for a family of four this year is about $65,000, between 65 dollars and $70,000. So 60% of that is thirty-eight dollars or $40,000. So the idea is that 10% of the apartment, to live in one of those apartments, uh, you have to make less than that amount of money a year. And that's how we kind of control for affordable for affordability in the housing units. So, good, good. Uh, oh, Great, thank you. That's very well explained. Um, do you know of any other developers or RFPs for this site that you might be aware of? Or is there a competition for this site in particular? There, there's not, um, you know, I'm um, working on this site with a, um, a housing operator that operates nationally and they have an RFP out um, that I, in conjunction with the city and this site applied for. So we're looking at the site and 
maybe potentially a few others in New Orleans, but um, as far as I know, there are no other um, groups currently working on this site in New Orleans. Would this property change hands? Um, and would that be required to go through a bidding process as far as um, surplus property? Yeah, that's a, good, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, probably yes is the answer and something that, you know, I think it, we're, we're working to define. Um, you know, the most likely scenario is that there would be some kind of a, a city RFP to lease the land um, and to do a ground lease for the city. That would most likely be the mechanism, but that's um, not still being figured out. David, you said you were working with a national partner. Uh, that, yeah, that's correct. So the the um, are you at liberty to say who that is? Or? Um, I can't. I can't say who that is. Yes, I can. I can tell you who that is. I I can't tell you a ton about the um, about some of the details. But there's a group called Common Living, and they're a um, housing operator. Uh, they have several different types of housing, but they're they're. Um, they, they try to be a kind of more active operator of, of housing. And um, they have a, for example, they have a company called NOAA, which stands for Naturally Occurring Affordable Housing. And so they're trying, it's basically an acronym for workforce housing. So they're um, managing those types of properties around the country. Um, what they're working on here and uh, uh, at several other cities and, and locations in the country is um, a housing type that has services or amenities that makes it easier for people who are working from home. Um, so the idea is that in the, some of the working changes that came from the pandemic are going to become a little bit more permanent. And as people work from home, their, uh, what they need in their housing might change a little bit. So that's what they're, what they're focused on. And, and okay. part of the idea of this project. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Rachel kind of addressed your, uh, address your question. Uh, I believe this is a private RFP and not a public request for proposal. That's so correct. It, yeah, this is actually coming through a housing operator and not actually being presented from the city. Correct. Um, but you're just trying, if, if you have worked with anyone within the city, I guess it's mostly city planning to verify a lot of the land use around this area. And um, anyone else you want to mention department-wise? I, I wouldn't know the, the process. No, I mean, I, I've been in, in touch with the, the council member, Jeruso, um, mm -hmm. so, so he's aware. And um, you know, mayor's office, economic development, city planning, kind of just er early days with all those groups trying to figure out how to put the pieces together. It's always an interesting puzzle. All right, uh, last call for any questions. Um, Lisa wanted to get, someone wanted to get your email address. I believe I listed that in the agenda, uh, the first link at the top, if that doesn't show up for you, um, please let me know. I can also get that for you or I can post it here. Let me hold on a second if you don't mind. Sure, yeah, thank you, Chris. Feel free to share that. All right. Uh, available parking for the location. Yeah, we plan to accommodate parking within the building. Um, the, the, the details are, you know, to be determined, but I think we we plan to provide parking. I think it's important, and uh, the exact parking ratio is, you know, to, to be determined, but definitely something we're working on. Any other questions this evening? Uh, is there any way to put a restriction on short-term rental use for some sort of uh, development like this? Um, yeah, uh, uh, sure. I mean, I, I think it will, um, certainly the building will comply with the underlying or the adjacent zoning. So what we're looking at for zoning guidance or the um, HMU zoning across the street and, and some of the proposed MU1 districts. And I'm by 
don't hold me to this, but I'm pretty sure neither of those districts permit commercial short-term rentals. So that would address that issue. But certainly the, the intent is not to have, not to have short-term rentals in the building. Understood. All right, last chance for questions. Uh, I entered Mr. Heck's email address in the chat as well. Obviously, this is still very early planning phases. Um, thank you for coming forward to the community and trying to get input and you know elicit people's interests and thoughts on the on the property. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Thank you for making a few minutes for me. And um, you all have my email address. Feel free. Uh, if you think of any further questions to bug me and um, I expect I'll be back here again with you soon as we move things along. So I, I look forward to working with all of you um, as the project proceeds. So thank you very much. And Chris, thanks for setting this up. All right. Thank you very much. Cool. Um, just while we're here on this area, the neighborhood, uh, you may have seen it. It was in the, the agenda that went out. There's also a outstanding uh, land use item uh, near here for uh, a live permit conditional use uh, for a bar that's to be uh, hopes to be developed um, the address of 601 to 615 North Broad and uh, 2701 Lafitte Avenue it has a CPC hearing coming up uh, the meeting on February 9th I'm putting the information in the chat and it was also in the uh, the meeting agenda that went out. Um, there's also another land use notice about neighborhood participation um, notice that went out about a gas station on or about a convenience store that would like to convert to a full-time gas station as well. So please, um, you know, if you're not aware on how to put your public comment in um, and these different steps, uh, of where we are with these applications. Um, once it hit, goes to CPC, so the first step, at least with, with these, is, is the MPP. They're required, an applicant's required to put in a notice to the neighborhood to elicit information about the project and then turn that in with their application to the CPC or the BZA, uh, whichever one's hearing the, the application. And then now this one at uh, North Broad Street is at the CPC public hearing phase where you would uh, share your public input directly with the CPC for their hearing. So that information is entered here. Please uh, please follow up and, and submit information as needed. So uh, moving on down the agenda, uh, I believe Council Member Giruso is here. I'm here. Hello. Hey, how are you doing? Good to see you. Good evening, everybody. Um, happy New Year. First of all, to start off with, it's, it's good to see everybody. Um, obviously, I was hoping uh, we'd be a little bit further along in some of the COVID issues, but it looks like uh, we're actually trending in the wrong direction. Uh, one little note I want to make at the outset, Chris, and I don't know how much of an issue it is for this neighborhood because so much uh, seems to be younger but um, Children's Hospital is actually a place where people who are 70 or older can get their COVID vaccinations. And so um, I'm thrown off by the name myself because you wouldn't think Children's would be a place where you can do that. But from what I'm hearing from LCMC, uh, people don't realize that Children's is a viable place not only to receive the vaccine, but actually it, it's more available there than a lot of other traditional hospitals that you may be thinking of. So I just kind of wanted to make that little PSA to start out with um, uh, and, and, and from the outset. The next thing I wanted to briefly touch upon is this. Uh, we, uh, we still meet about quarterly on the Jesuit ad hoc committee. It was something that I asked to start um, sort of in concert with the bridge, walkway, whatever word you want to use for it, to, um, to make sure that the neighbors were being heard, there was dialogue, and, and really most importantly for me, um, particularly having been a student there myself now close to 25 years ago, is that I know that the neighbors get frustrated with, with the kids being in there and that it, it just seems to be an us versus them on both sides mentality. 
and, and to begin a conversation. So we talked last Thursday sort of about COVID, what they're doing with that, how they're managing it. Their numbers have actually been very good. Um, of course, you know, there's still an issue here and there. And uh, I just wanted to take a second also to thank Emily Leitzinger. As you all know, Emily had been president of MCNO. She was at the, at the birth of this uh, committee, uh, you know, just at this point saying this is the right time for her to step away. But I really um, appreciate the fact that she was so engaged to begin with and that she stuck with it for a period of time afterwards and as we continue to have those discussions. Um, you know, we have our, our council meeting coming up, I would say kind of um, – in, in, in sort of important three things. Number one is uh, no matter what neighborhood you're living in right now, um, crime continues to be an issue. Um, you know, it's, it's sometimes dumping is more of an issue in one place or the other or um, sewage and water board bills, but all of us are being touched you know, particularly by crime right now. And so I know the council is, is, is working to put something together um, and um, and uh, we want to make sure that, you know, not only is it a place for for discussion, but also obviously some solutions um, as well. Uh, also, uh, Council Member Williams took office today uh, as the new DA. And with that, uh, under state law, there can't be dual office holdings. So he had to resign as council president and as um, the council at large, because he resigned today um, with, um, with less than a year in office remaining, our terms expire January 9th, 2022. Uh, we will have to appoint an interim city council member who will sit on the council um, until the next election. So it's, it's an important appointment, and uh, by, by, by statute, by charter, we are required to pick that person um, really by the next meeting on the 28th. So it's a truncated process. It's going to move very fast. There's a link right now on the council's website if anybody wants to apply for that. Uh, but un unfortunately, we only get 30 days and we have to select somebody at our regular meeting. We can't set a special meeting and the February meeting will be too far out. And then sort of the last thing I would imagine this group would be interested in is at this meeting, we have to vote on the Folgers ITEPs. There was a presentation at the last economic development committee meeting about that. I think people know ITEP is industrial tax exemption program and sort of just question about, um, you know, right now at this moment, uh, uh, whether or not it makes sense the efficacy of granting tax exemptions, um, particularly when um, we're, we're in necessitous circumstances. And, and it's not just Folgers, to be clear, right? I mean, one of the things I've talked about a whole lot is, is looking more at fees um, in the future as opposed to property taxes because you can get nonprofits involved and, and they need to be paying for the basic services that we all do. Um, so uh, that, is, that is probably the most significant vote on, on this agenda. Um, the city's also introducing a foreclosure registry, which apparently is a best practice in many other cities and it was sprung from 2008, 2009 market collapse and just really the ability to track foreclosed properties um, and get them back into commerce rather than sitting idly by in case something you know, happens, particularly, I guess, as a result of the pandemic. So that is, that's my report for tonight. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, obviously, um, we'll have our sewage and water board quarterly report meeting with the agency next month. Um, they will bring their new CFO and they have a new customer representative um, who's, who's supposed to be helping out with some of the billing and I think customer service issues. Uh, but uh, our staff has been working every Monday with them to try and uh, bring some more clarity to individual bills as well as the billing process overall. And so um, I think that meeting is the 16th, but we'll, we'll, we can get that to you before, um, 
real soon. Uh, and, and we'll, I'm happy to answer any questions anybody may have otherwise. So we got one in the chat. Uh, you're receiving any input about byte lane changes on the Invil or uh, any expansions in the CBD? I have not received anything about either one um, per se. Obviously, um, I, I try and stay as attuned as possible to what happens in District A, which is not to say if it happens somewhere else, it doesn't matter. Um, we have a presentation, though, tomorrow. We actually have a joint public works transportation committee meeting to discuss two things. One is the new bike sharing program um, that the city has been working on. And then secondly, sort of what the status of complete streets program looks like as well. And so obviously all of us were kind of interested, I would think particularly with the pandemic to see what's going on there. And if there's a particular issue about Bienville, we're happy to look into that. I, I, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. I do know that Jack Carey, who um, lives in Fallburg, St. John, has reached out, and they're trying to work a little bit closer to Moss Street about um, s some slowing issues, trying to get things um, moving a little bit more slowly around the bayou, but I haven't heard anything about Bienville per se. Yeah, I'm trying to remember where we saw, I guess it was a piece on Mid-City Messenger about the expansion of bike lanes on Bienville and would essentially re remove a, one of the lanes of traffic. Um, I think that's what the question might be pertaining to. And, and, and the thing I can say about that too, Chris, is, mm -hmm. um, you know, because of what happened on Marconi, and, and I will just say fairly or unfairly the backlash as a result of that, which in my view was from a lack of communication as much as anything else. The complete streets ordinance I amended so that um, the city needs to have a meeting with the relevant neighborhood groups before any road diet takes place. So the, the city would actually have to come to MCNO, Faubourg, St. John, probably City Park Triangle as well and begin discussing that. So um, there, there's, there's a there's at least a 30 day um, safe harbor period where the city will, will have that information and have a public discussion before anything were to happen. Um, maybe Stephen can cover this. You wouldn't know any updates with uh, the process of assessor records and those property assessments. The, the only I, I, I can start the ball rolling and then I'll, I'll happily hand off to Stephen on this one. Um, what what I do know is um, the way the city provided the millage information, it caused a delay with the Louisiana Tax Commission. My understanding is the Tax Commission was supposed to approve the tax rolls last Wednesday. Assuming that happened, I think that should be the final place piece for um, the tax bills to start being generated, but I defer to Stephen on sort of what a timetable looks like. Yeah, we were waiting on uh, the state approval. Um, honestly, I don't have uh, a timetable on, on that. Um, I don't know for sure if it, if it happened. My understanding was that it was like, it was like the councilman's that it was imminent and, and the city would start um, providing the, 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 the tax information um, this week. So, uh, yeah, we're all, all looking forward to, to that information so we can, you know, take care of it. Yeah, delays were expected considering the vote was a December election. And then, obviously, you know, even though I believe we have rule of law of the city, uh, the tax, state tax commission still has to approve all roles, correct? Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, if you don't mind, uh, Stephen, uh, I had one person who had contacted us about wanting to introduce themselves. Uh, last call yeah, for I questions. And, and can I make can I make just one other comment too, Chris? Absolutely. I'm sorry. So um, so everybody also knows, um, and I don't know how many more, maybe two lane, maybe one or other ones will affect the mid city region, but obviously we're still immersed in the in the street renaming as well. Um, 
you know, the state controls whether or not um, you have to get a new license. Apparently for people on Norman Francis, they weren't willing to, um, to waive the fees that are associated with it. But Representative Hilferty is going to file a bill prospectively that their uh, new street name changes being implemented that that will be waived. And I know the city has put out some really good information about the fact that they are preemptively contacting sewage and water board and energy and all of the telecom companies. If you live on Norman Francis to, to help with the bill changing. So I just, I just wanted to get that out there as well. Um, I think the question is more of a, about maybe an economic impact study about street name changes for future decisions to be made. Um, is that something the committee could take up? Well, I mean, the hard part has been the committee has seen its charge as, as changing names. And frankly, in my view, has done it without a lot of neighborhood input. So um, I, think, I think that's something that the council members are considering. And maybe the best way I can say it is this way. I tell everybody that boards and commissions, particularly the ones that appeal to the council, view things one-dimensionally, and it's our job to view them three-dimensionally. And so obviously the impact is something we're looking at, number one. Number two, um, if a street name is going to be changed, like let's, for example, Robert E. Lee is more likely than not to be changed. One of the things I think that needs to happen is a delay in the process so that people can get new stationery, that you can make the necessary changes, and that's as painless as possible. And then there's other streets, just to be perfectly candid, where neighbors um, want to rededicate the street. So I'll give you, you know, one or two examples where that's being discussed. Um, Patton, for example, Uptown, is named after Isaiah Patton, who was a Confederate, later mayor of New Orleans, and those neighbors want to rededicate it to the general, George Patton. So, you know, there, there, there are some streets that may get a rededication and that may be um, the value of a plaque and, and some more discussion. And there's other streets that are probably going to get wholesale changes that, that are you know, just going to be different. But one of the conversations I'm trying to have is, um, you know, what is the cost in changing the street names and, and can there be a feathering in of time so that people um, – can, can start using whatever they have, their old checks, their stationery, et cetera, so they're not absorbing all these new costs simultaneously. All right, last call for any questions, comments? All right, thank you much. Thank you very right. much. Thanks, Chris. Hope everybody has a good evening. Take care. Uh, Ms. DeAndre, did you want to introduce yourself and talk about uh, your business in the community? Yes, uh, thank you for letting me speak. Um, so my name is Naomi. I'm with a new company. We're called That Title. We are an auto title company. So we do title transfers, registration renewals. We even do boat stuff and notaries and things like that. Uh, we just opened really recently, and we're in the American Can Company building. Uh, so you know, in a, gen a pretty general area, but um, I just wanted to let you guys know that we're there. Um, we're trying to, you know, pick up steam, get the word out. And right now we're having a discount on all of our deals. So everything is 25% off of our fees. State fees still remain the state fees. But um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. I just wanted to let y'all know we were there. And if y'all had questions on anything, you know, title related or registration related, I'm more than happy to, to answer them for you guys. You don't have any identification services, do you? Uh, no. Right now, we do not do driver's licenses or anything. We have to wait six months for that. Um, after the six months, however, we sh hopefully will have it, crossing our fingers, but that's still kind of up in the air right now. The Naomi, name is Naomi. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, do you have a website or anything? I, I often yes. have to refer people over for titles of course let me i'll put it in the yeah okay. i put it i put it in the chat already it's uh d-a-t-t-i-t-l-e.com uh okay. it looks like yeah you do also have notarized services correct mm -hmm. okay thank you 
Uh, the name is that title and let's see. We are currently not open on weekends. However, I am more than happy and willing to work with you guys on your schedule. Right now with COVID hours, we're open nine to five, Monday to Friday. Uh, if you need us to stay late, like I said, more than happy to stay late. Just call us and let us know. Uh, we do take appointments if y'all want to do that. Let's see. Oh goodness, Metter, that's that's a while to drive. Oh goodness. Uh, yeah. Do y'all have any questions for me on anything? Not personally, but I want to welcome you to the neighborhood and thank you for reaching out to our group. Well, thank you for letting me talk and everything. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank all of you guys. <laughs> and like I said, if y'all have questions, just feel free to reach out. More than happy to help you guys. Call, email me. Uh, everything's on the website. Um, so, yeah, thank you guys. <laughs> all right. Uh, Stephen Mosgrove with Neighborhood Engagement. Hey everybody! Thanks, Chris. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. Um, I want to I want to thank everyone uh, for allowing me a couple of weeks rest at the tail end of December. It was sorely needed and very well used, um, both in uh, uh, resting and, and thinking about 2021. Um, just a few things I want to mention. Uh, first is is related to COVID. Um, of course, we're experiencing a surge in cases um, in, in the parish. Um, and so I really want to kind of re, refocus folks on getting tested and testing and taking, taking advantage of uh, the um, opportunity to get tested and get tested regularly. Uh, it's, it's, it, obviously, we all know that it's one of those um, uh, conditions that that you know you can test negatively one day and, and quite frankly unfortunately um, uh, catch it the next um, so regular testing as, as best your, your schedule allows um, you know please take advantage of that uh, there's there's ongoing mobile testing uh, usually at Mahalia Jackson uh, in their parking lot or at UNO's Lakefront Arena, or even in our, our neighboring parish of Jefferson Parish at the Alario Center in West Wego, deep in uh, the West Bank of Jefferson Parish. Uh, so just want to encourage folks to do that. The COVID Meals Program uh, continues to operate with the city uh, through FEMA funding. So um, it that will operate through January. Um, as you all have caught on, you know, there's is the, the approval by FEMA is a month-to-month -month, um, proposition. And so uh, the city's gotten approval for another month through through January, the rest of January. Um, vaccines, of course, we're on uh, uh, you know phase one A and phase one B tier one. Um, and I'll I'll put a couple of links in the chat box uh, that kind of explain that um, and what that means and and whom it covers uh, and and when it started, things of that sort. Um, Oh, and one thing, if, if you're if you need the COVID meals program or you want to share that information to to neighbors or uh, people in your network, whether professional or personal, uh, just have them call 311 uh, for the service. So and then um, second thing, I, I well, uh, the second thing I want to mention is, um, as you know, the city works with the police department uh, on its. PCABs, we call them PCABs, uh, but the PCAB stands for Police Community Advisory Boards. And um, we are opening up uh, through Neighborhood Engagement, uh, who, who kind of monitors and, and, and coordinates uh, the, the, the program with NOPD, with S Sergeant Merrick's uh, at, at NOPD. Um, we're opening up applications uh, for board members. I really want to encourage anyone who wants to um, participate in the third district, or since we're in mid cities, first district and and and, and third district uh, boards. Uh, an active member of MCNO, Patrick Armstrong, who who now lives in Gentilly, uh, is on the third uh, district board um, and was so as a as a as a resident of mid city. Uh, and can remain so as a resident of Gentilly because his section of Gentilly, Gentilly is still in the third district. I just want to encourage people to get involved. 
police, the, the police, the PCABs are a little different from the non-PAC process. Um, as I've shared before, it's, uh, it's an opportunity. It's, it's more uh, community led or citizen led or board led, I should say. Um, the, the PCAB boards will coordinate the meetings. They will advertise the meetings. They will engage communities uh, and residents to get involved in their meetings. Um, and, and neighborhood engagement helps and supports and guides, uh, but there's a uh, considerable um, self-reliance and, and independent uh, component to the PCAB. Uh, that's, that's one difference between PCABs and the non-PACs. The second is, is perhaps more substantive, and that's the fact that the PCABs provide a policy perspective from the citizenry, uh, from the neighborhoods within the, the district. And uh, it can it can provide NOPD recommendations uh, for on policing, and um, and the and the police once presented with an official recommendation voted on by the board, maybe instigated by people who uh, attended the meetings and 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 all of that. Uh, NOPD has to respond within 30 days uh, to to um, th that recommendation. I believe it's 30 days. It might be a little more, but but. It's 30 days is, is very much in my, in my brain. Uh, and so there's, a, there's an obligation of NOPD. So it's a really good um, civic action, I think. And if you, if you want to apply, uh, go to nola.gov forward slash PCAB. And I'll put that in the chat box as well, but nola.gov forward slash PCAB. And then finally, um, uh, neighborhood engagement. Uh, today, we started our community office hours again. Uh, so we're out in the field um, uh, once again after uh, being shut down by COVID throughout most of 2020. Uh, and so community office hours, for those who don't know, um, is it's just an outreach um, initiative that uh, the mayor's office does where we we're liaisons to each council district in the case of District A, uh, myself, will be out in the field uh, making themselves available to talk to residents about issues, whether it's policy related or uh, uh, constituent services related. Uh, and, and so it's just, a, it's just another access point for, uh, for residents. So those have started again. I'll be at the Mid-City Library, so that's really easy for Mid-City uh, uh, residents. Um, and that's at 4140 Canal Street. I'm there Monday through Wednesday from 1030 to 5 p.m. I do get a lunch at 12 o'clock, uh, which is an improvement from last year and, and the year before. So I'm, I'm excited about that. And, uh, and so I'll be p bringing some lunch sometimes and patronizing a, a mid-city business. So that's always nice, too. Um, and uh, so avail yourselves of, of my presence. There is one little difference from previous iterations of community office hours. Um, you, you, you have to make an appointment uh, and that just fits uh, COVID protocols. And that, that also fit the library's protocols because the library takes appointments for those who wanna enter the building as well. Um, and so uh, you can, you can, you can uh, uh, make the appointment at, uh, nola.gov forward slash COH. And I'll put that in the chat box as well, but uh, nola.gov forward slash COH. And uh, you make an appointment and, and I'll be waiting on you. Um, and go from there. Um, you know, I, I did want to mention, of course, you know, we were talking about the, the renaming of uh, North and South Jeff Davis. Uh, of course, that started, that began on January 1. Um, and uh, and I've noticed some of the, the input about cost to the residents uh, there. And of course, the, the naming of the renaming of that street was is kind of a one off by the city council, where they you know they voted they made that change and 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 the city has executed that. Um, of course, the the street naming commission is broader, and uh, and it's just going through a different process. Um, but duly noted about uh, you know maybe lessons learned. Um, from from the change uh, uh, to Norman uh, Norman Francis, uh, so just wanted to mention that and and, and know that I noted um, the perspective, um, and that's it, Mr. Bloom. Appreciate the time as always. Uh, can you tell me what uh, 
typically people use community office hours for? I mean, I know that's uh, yeah. during the day and everything, but I'm, I'm just yeah, not it, familiar it, with it. It depends. I, I would say the, the, the vast majority uh, uh, of, of conversations revolve around constituent service needs. Um, so it's almost like uh, say I have an email, a text, or a call. Uh, it, it's just a personal one on one conversation. And, and there are a lot of people who uh, appreciate that, that type of, 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 of communication, um, uh, particularly folks who don't want to be electronic as much as, uh, you know, all you, all you young folk out there. So, um, or whoever, you know, whatever their, their rationale is. Um, I personally like one-on-one -on -one conversations quite a bit. Um, I still go into a bank to, <laughs> to, to transact business. I, I, I like a, a human element to, um, to my, to my life. Um, so, so it, it provides that. And, and it, it also provides, a, um, just, uh, it can be oftentimes a more substantive conversation when it is a conversation you know, a back and forth. And uh, so, yeah, but it's like a situation needs, but there, there are ideas that come from residents and, and, and other policy oriented uh, perspectives. Good question. Uh, Thank you. Oh, sure. Uh, one question. Uh, did the city have input for pharmacies chosen for vaccine distribution or is that mostly orchestrated by the state? Yeah, mostly by the state. You know, there was a, there was a, um, I noticed a, a a heavy lean towards you know small pharmacies, independently owned uh, pharmacies, and perhaps that was part of the rationale. But um, you know, state state made those decisions. Can I mention something? Sure. Of those uh, six pharmacies in the New Orleans area, one would only take their own patients, not anybody else. Two of them closed at like five or five thirty, which really mm. limited access for working people. Mm. And um, the other three, I never could get in touch with. You know. Yeah, yeah, that's a good perspective, Mary. And I think I think right off the bat, one of the one of the challenges was each one, and I would say, is, I guess, is relatively safe to to say um, throughout the state, the pharmacies got small, a limited amount of supply and so um the demand of course is much greater than the supply that uh each pharmacy individually got and and even collectively you know um so but there there are um there are a variety of of avenues if you're in the in the, to, to receive a vaccine if you're um in the in the operational tiers or 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 phases um that I mentioned, um, and um, but then of course uh, options will have to expand out as as the general public distributions happen in in the upcoming months. So, all right. Anyone else have a question? Uh, one person comments that they were able to make an appointment through Walgreens uh, online. So I know there's going to be a lot of different outlets providing different services and different schedules, uh, and it's going to be difficult to keep it all straight and including the council members information about Children's Hospital also being an option for people. So, yeah. I see a comment from Ms. Lyon saying some things are best discussed face to face. I agree with that. That's that's a good that's a good point, too. So sometimes you just want to talk more privately. Yep. There's no talks about OBS opening up another location for Mid City, would there? Not that I know of. Um, okay. They've ceased. They've ceased the the, the field work um, as of now, um, mm -hmm. and I don't know what their 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 next step is. Um, I, I would, you know, that that first iteration is probably a little bit of a trial run and and. Uh, you know, I have to talk to Jeff or Peter to see how they think it went. Sure. Uh, how long did that pilot program go for? A couple months. Uh, yeah, if that much. But yeah. it's it's about about that. So that that was uh, the Office of Business and External Services had opened up some satellite offices 
within libraries, one of them at the, oh, I can't remember the name of it, but the one in Broadmoor, they had an office mm -hmm. there for yeah, constituent Rosa services. Keller. Right. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much, Stephen. If there's no other questions for neighborhood engagement. All right, uh, anyone else in attendance need to comment or give an update on anything? Uh, recheck the Louisiana Department of Health site for vaccination locations. Some new ones are posted today. All right. Um, just going to shout out a couple other events and uh, things going on around Mid City. Uh, you know, one of our last meetings, we had an update from the crew of house floats and our Mid City captains doing a lot of coordination with Stronghold Studios located on uh, 4429 Bienville and another artistic provider of floats and, and events uh, through Mid City. They're or, uh, orchestrating a food drive right now. Uh, they are trying to collect 300 pounds of food donations by the 15th. And I think they're near there or want to really try to exceed that total. So please, uh, I believe, Business hours available to drop off food items. Uh, I guess I don't know the details about perishable, non-perishable. I would assume non-perishable at 4429 Bienville Street at Stronghold Studios. Um, yeah. Uh, also mentioned uh, the land use items. Please submit your public comment if you have uh, interest in letting your voice be heard about these land use items. Uh, conditional use for uh, live entertainment and bar, and as well as a uh, conditional use to change from a convenience store to a gas station. Um, those information, that information was in the outgoing agenda item notice. And uh, please let us know about anything you want to update us with. I believe we have another project. Uh, conditional use being applied for also near the greenway of a warehouse space that wants to be uh, that wants to convert into or give permit for live event and live performance as well as um, entertainment space uh, so they were not prepared to present at this meeting but I believe they'll be ready to at least talk about that space um, by next month so speaking of which uh, our next meeting is February 8th, 6 p.m. Virtual, I assume, uh, still going on. Uh, please reach out to myself, president at mco.org, or to the board at info at mcno.org as we put together planning for that meeting. And then also uh, we meet as a board on January 26th. Uh, please reach out to myself uh, for any member Mem uh, interested members in filling our vacancy on the board. Uh, also coming up, uh, Lafitte Greenway is having their annual membership meeting on Wednesday, January 20th, where they'll be selecting new board members um, and going over uh, their ideas and formulation of plans in the future. And then also Mid City Security District is meeting on Wednesday, the same evening, January 20th, at 6 p.m. typically. Uh, please check their websites for changes. We'll also broadcast any changes to their um, to their information as well. So that's it for everyone. Thank you for attending and uh, thank you for engaging and love Mid City and hope to have some great events, if not activities for us to convene over in 2021. So thanks everybody. Thank you, Chris.